What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Let's Machine back here again for Practical Machinist. Today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be answering the questions we asked you to send in previously on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. So for next time, if you guys wanna get questions in for this, you can DM us at any time or leave a comment. Before we get started, make sure you like and subscribe below so you can see more videos. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, we asked you to send in your questions um, that you would like me to answer in the best way I can. Um, you know, to kind of figure out what you guys are interested in and see if you guys had any specific things you'd like us to talk about. So today we're gonna be going through those. Um, we did not associate the names with the questions because we wanted to keep it anonymous. Um, next time, if you'd like us to say your name, you can just let us know, but for now, these are all anonymous. So if you ask this question, thank you very much for sending them in. And we're gonna go through them one by one. So I have them all on a piece of paper here, so forgive me from looking at them. The first one is, can you name a motivational podcast on manufacturing machining business? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I don't listen to a lot of specifically machining ones. Uh, I do find there are a lot of really good business ones out there, but the one that has to do with machining a business that I do listen to quite frequently is called the Business of Machining Podcast. It's with John Grimsmo and John Saunders. John Grimsmo is a Canadian guy. Uh, one of my good friends works for him actually. He makes knives, very, very high quality knives. And John Saunders, if you guys obviously watch machining YouTube a lot, is uh, the owner of New York CNC, uh, or I believe it's Saunders Machine Works. I think his channel is NYCNC. But the Business of Machining podcast is a fantastic, fantastic podcast. Um, it's two guys talking about their experiences in building shops. You know, John is a guy, John Grimsmo anyway, is a guy who went from basically himself and his brother making knives at their house or in their garage to having a shop now where I know they're hiring another three machinists. I think they have six or seven guys there. Um, you know, this guy makes some of the best knives in the world. So watching him go from that into what he's turning into is fascinating and he has a lot of great insights in there. And John Saunders is a guy who went, I believe the same kind of route, but more in production machining. And he does a lot of um, teaching CNC and job shop type stuff. So it's interesting to see the different ways they think and the way they bounce off each other. And I think it's, it's really good information for people who are trying to get into more of the business end of machining. Um, much like with my own channel, with my own series here, the Shop Talk series, I feel like there's a lot of good resources out there for how to machine and how to set up a machine. But I feel like there isn't a lot of information out there, uh, a lot of quality information out there on the machining end or the business end of machining. So that's a great one, the Business of Machining podcast. So I hope that's helpful. The next question is, what is the best app for CNC programming? Now, first and foremost, I don't use any apps in terms of iPhone apps to program. I believe there are probably some out there. I've never used any, so I can't speak to them. If you're asking what software I use, I use Mastercam uh, 2019. I haven't upgraded to 2020. I have used uh, Fusion. And really, the best software is gonna be the best one for your needs. You can spend as much money as you want on software, getting NX or Siemens. You know, you can spend a ton of money getting software or you can spend no money getting software and use something free or cheap. Realistically, it's going to be what you're comfortable with, what you've learned on, what level of support you need, and what level of functionality you need. If you're a guy with a garage shop and you have a CNC router and you're making 2D signs, you probably don't need a lot of the 3D pathing or chaining that a higher end software is gonna have. Um, you could probably do it with something very basic or even just G code. So long story short, to not endorse anybody specifically, I'll just say the best software, if you're asking that in that question, is the one that best suits your needs and basically is the best price point for what you're comfortable to pay for what you need out of it, okay? Next question is, how do I convince my team leaders to start doing machine maintenance? This is a sticky one. Um, I have heard a lot of horror stories and just even just going to different shops where I've been subbing out work or going to cool down work, you know, I, I, a couple factories I go to, they have two or three CNC stuck in the, short, in the corner, even though we do the majority of their CNC work. And seeing some of the maintenance issues with these machines that are blatant just from looking at the machine, it's, it, it's hard to look at sometimes. The best way to convince your team leaders to do maintenance is basically just by doing it yourself and showing them the benefits of having a properly maintained machine. Um, 
At the end of the day, unfortunately, if you are not in a position to make those choices yourself, and you can't be wasting company time to do it if they think you should be doing something else. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of people getting in a situation where they have a machine go down and realize that it was very preventable in order to motivate them to do better. Um, you know, when it comes to dealing with people in a superior position to you and trying to tell them what you think they should do, all you can do is present your case in the best way possible. And for maintenance, it's gonna be laying out, hey, look how much time we can save and how much better the machine runs and how much downtime we avoid by doing machine maintenance that takes you know, an hour once a week versus having the machine down for two days while we wait for parts, it's also gonna cost five grand. Um, unfortunately, at the end of the day, if people don't wanna see that kind of relation, you can't really make them. Um, you know, it's something to keep in mind when you're in that position and it's something to keep in mind for when you have your own shop. Um, machine maintenance is critical. I've let my, it lapse on my machines before and I suffered for it. So it's a lesson you have to learn the hard way, unfortunately, and if you can pick up on that before you do learn it the hard way, it'll save you a lot of time and grief. Okay, next question is, how do you <coughs> keep up, excuse me, how do you keep up cash flow? It can be hard to juggle net 30 terms and having to buy big material for big jobs up front. Excellent question. So for those of you who don't know, net 30 terms basically means that a customer sends me a PO saying what kind of work they want done, and that's the contract essentially, and I offer them terms on credit. Now, first of all, if it's a new customer, usually I only do cash on delivery because I've seen it go bad where you do a lot of work for somebody and then they decide they don't wanna pay and your legal recourse is difficult. We do have a video on that, which you can find on here, how to deal with a customer that doesn't wanna pay, one of the shop talk series, I'll link it here below. But net 30 terms means that payment is not due until 30 days after receipt of the product. So you do the work, you ship it 30 days after the ship or receive date, you get paid. Where this comes into an issue and what this question is asking is, when you have a big job, so let's say I'm doing a job that I have to put 20 grand worth of material in my shop to do the job, then I have to run it, let's say it takes 30 days to run it, then I ship it, it's gonna be 60 days from me buying that material until I get paid. Now, I have terms with my customer, with my suppliers too, where I have net 30 terms, so it helps to lessen that. But the biggest thing is, is keeping that cash flow is difficult and keeping that cash flow is a tricky balance. And I don't know if there's any one real good solution for it, but what I do is I try to keep more money in the bank than we need at all times. Um, sometimes that means putting off larger purchases. Sometimes that means, um, you know, putting off paying certain things until those terms. I like to pay things before terms are due. Sometimes it means waiting until terms are due. It's never worth it waiting longer and dragging a supplier to try to chase money out of you. It's never worth it because you'll never get the same level of service out of them again. But trying to keep more money in the bank than you need is pretty much the only solution for this. The other solution is that even for customers where I have a net 30 terms, if it's a large, large job where I'm gonna have to put in, you know, let's say $50,000 worth of material or $70,000 worth of material on the floor that I just don't have in the bank to finance, we do have credit and all that, but if I don't really feel comfortable doing that, I'll do net 30 terms with 50% up front or 25% up front or 30% up front as part of me quoting that job out. Um, I don't have the capital to be going out and financing material for huge jobs like that for multiple customers at the same time. We're just too small a business. Because we have such a high overhead and such a high startup cost for that, you know, it's, it's just gonna be the way we're gonna do that job. And honestly, if a customer's not willing to play ball with you that way, in my opinion, it's usually not worth over leveraging yourself to get the work unless you feel extremely confident in it. Um, I've seen a lot of companies end up having to fold because they got themselves in a bad situation, their cash flow didn't work out, and all of a sudden they couldn't finance their jobs, they couldn't pay their guys, they couldn't pay their mortgage, they couldn't pay their rent, and all of a sudden they have to close. Committing to a very large job that way with net 30 terms flat out, all I'm gonna say is you better have the money in the bank to finance it because otherwise, all you're doing is putting yourself in a very precarious position. Um, I see that this has already been <laughs> about 10 minutes. We're gonna cut it there for today, guys. I have a lot more questions. We're gonna do a volume two of this at some point. If you guys have more questions, I would love to hear them. Also, in the comments, if you could go through and answer each of the questions that I just answered with what you think is the right answer, it would be awesome. You know, This is all about sharing information and trying to help each other out I have one source of information, you are another source of information for people, and I'm sure you guys know stuff that I don't. 
So please feel free to share that in the comments and make sure you send your, your uh, questions in for the next episode into either our Instagram account, our Twitter account, or you can leave them as comments here under this video. Thank you very much for watching guys. Hope you have a great day. You take care.